Welcome to If the Walls Could Talk in Buffalo podcast with Don Purdy, former member of the Buffalo Bills front office, 27 years, and Josh Cormier, a member of the coaching staff under the Wade Phillips regime. And we are here, as always, to talk with you about the Buffalo Bills of 1990 and, of course, 2022. Welcome to If the Walls Could Talk in Buffalo podcast. How are you doing? I'm Fine, but I, I have to tell you, Josh, I had breakfast this morning with uh, our friend Marlon. Yeah, Kerner. my my Twitter reckoning. How did I? How did uh, I fare? He uh, he said, "Here's what he said." He's had a busy week, <laughs> and uh, a friend of his was on Twitter, and they reached out to him and said, "Hey, did you see what if the walls could talk in so, the so podcast?" For back, on there? So for background, <laughs> for background, we we had Kurt Schultz on our on our live show yesterday. And I was going through some old highlights, and I found uh, the big hit Kurt had against uh, Dallas Cowboys, Herschel Walker, John Madden was talking it up, you know, whatever. During the course of the game, there was a punt uh, that the Bills had from around midfield. Oh, that was the same game? Same game. Oh, that makes sense. Okay, that and was Dallas Dallas 96. 96. Jim right. Kelly okay. was hurt. Todd Collins started. Yeah. Uh, the Bills won 10-7. Um, kind of a, a, a tough game to watch. Uh, so, but, but the Cowboys had yeah, they Aikman, had, they had, Irvin, yep. and Irvin. Won the Super Bowl the year before. Yeah. So, uh, and it had the John Madden had some all treatment. You know, the whole it was mm. a big Fox late game. It was a it was a four fifteen. I remember game. I remember seeing that week. I think it was the first time I had seen John Madden in our building. Yeah, I th- he he mentioned I think it was the first time he had been there in like fifteen years. And they came on a Saturday to do some prep. Connect. It was weird. It's funny his flashback. I remember walking down the halls and hearing his voice. <laughs> And, you know, the iconic voice yeah. and like who's watching because there's TVs and sure stuff. who's and then that's that's like real him. And I walk by and I I, I never realized how wide he really was, was like, he like six, six, I, he was he was four? sitting down. Oh, but I just remember like just wide. Yeah. And with the voice and like, oh, my gosh, <laughs> some of them, man. that was that was they were larger than life in terms, you know, they were bigger than any broadcast team now. And now you have Al Michaels, obviously iconic and then right you know joe buck troy aikman and then uh you know jim nance and tony romo mm-hmm. but madden and summer i mean oh. Matt, Madden was a cultural phenomenon I mean, video game no doubt after, yeah. um, all that anyway diverse uh, story sure yeah. so so i watch going through and and chris moore has one of his you know his his, his famous eyeballs punt pin him at the 10 yard line ball bounces it's it's raining and Marlin is down there in, in position to to down the punt and it kind of does a little jump and then to try to catch the ball to obviously down the ball. He he gave me his take on oh, the well, play. He, I'll, I'll share he's it. the NFL <laughs> athlete and I'm not. All I all I I meant Marlin had a little bit of trouble uh downing the ball and, and he didn't catch it the first time, then he didn't catch it the second time. So all I did on Twitter was just you know we uncovered some irrefutable evidence as to why Maryland played DB in the NFL and not received that. That was the point. And I, I, I'm messing with you, Josh. You had a good laugh about it. Uh, I did make clear that you, you run our, if the walls could talk in Buffalo, I, uh, Twitter. I, should, do. <laughs> sure. I contribute some things, but it's your baby. And might I, thankfully, thankfully <laughs> that we, we, yeah. are, we managed to stay out of some more controversial topics. Uh, okay, <laughs> sure. So, by the way, he said he might be able to come on Friday. Uh, he has a meeting from 10 to 1130. But if we go on, it'll, we're thinking of going on. Yeah, then, yeah. On Friday, thinking about that. If So he can come on for the second half. Uh, but his his take on that play, as his friend told him which play it was, remembered it, okay. was that he wasn't trying to catch the ball. Oh, wow. He was trying. The ball bounced backwards and he hit and is just trying to keep it and then from going behind him because now that's where the what i will do they would pick up the the the, you know the possession but i will i will re release the play on twitter okay and and (laughs) just let people judge for themselves okay as to whether (laughs) he was trying to catch the ball i understand what you're saying and what he's uh selling what i i I, and i would be happy to talk to marlon about this on friday i i I hear what he's selling i don't believe it (laughs) i'm sorry you don't bat the ball with two hands. You'd bat it with one hand. I, I I'm skeptical of that. All but right. we All love right. Marlon. And Marlon yeah, Marlon's our right. guy, and, and yeah. we're right. You were right about him. He's 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 a great dude, and I figured you know just a little bit of fun because he's at a at a level of athleticism that I never hope. You know, I was never even able to hope to achieve. So well, we thought when we were talking with Kurt yesterday, just about what these professional athletes. You know, we were talking to him about how scary it is as a as a DB. Um, particularly a city because you're 
thus the name, you're the safety net. Um, you're the last uh, line of defense, but um, having a one-on-one -on -one situation with a guy like Ty Tyreek Hill and um, yeah, Marlon second of these, like, you know, there's a lot of pressure on us. We can bump up. We hope he talks about this on, on Friday if he comes on, which kind of often them up a little bit, trying to use the sideline as a as another defender. But he hit it, yeah, if they get past us, it's a pretty scary proposition yeah. for a safety to have one-on-one. -on -one sure, like in home field, you know, yeah. with a running start. Yeah. So, you know, it'll be something else, uh, a little timely that we talk about. We do have uh, Andy Baltimore coming on later on, who uh, yeah. is is the is the yeah, is head of uh, all the, the food and the concessions at uh, Dadium uh, through Delaware North. And yeah, spoiler alert. We want folks to think about this this fact that the in one Bills home game in a tower span, they feed seventy four thousand people, which is more than most restaurants do in a year. Yeah, and he came he came on us uh, the home game this weekend. There's going to be a home game next weekend, and that's right there's a possibility of three and oh, and he still took some time. Yeah, uh, to share it's it's good. Stuff. Yeah, interesting interview that uh, you know yeah. we'll, we'll we'll play for you guys in a little bit. Uh, yesterday, what, Monday was Black Monday around the NFL. Black Monday is known a day that coaches get fired. Oh, and it happened. And I, you know, the <laughs> first person I thought of when I started thinking about coaches getting fired, well, first was Coach Aid, and then say, and then yeah, second right. was you. And uh, you know that prompted a special edition that we're going to do early day of the Wheel of Failed Bills mm. coaches. Okay. So we've spun the wheel twice today. Maybe we could talk for a few minutes about like the numerous black days that you you know were a part of and and saw and any kind of you know. Is this just open ended, or do you have somebody? Oh, we we, we have oh. couples. I'm, we're we're going <laughs> to help you with this, by the way. Uh, that's nice. that's that's a mystery. We can't. Uh, I think we might have to. Uh, we can't. We can't. We can't reveal that. So the first one is is a coach who not just a lot of success uh, and is is going to be off as a coordinator for a playoff team. And I felt like he did a good job here and kind of got you – know, it ended weirdly. And maybe you can share some, some of that. Greg Rowe. Oh, that was the craziest timing. Yeah. Greg Roman was uh, – he, ca he came to us with some gravitas. Uh, the, the year he came it was um, – man, who was that under? It was – I think it was under – was. Rex? Uh, Ray was under Rex. You're right. And, um, you know, the offense has been pretty good. But then there was all this, this rumbling in the building about, you know, they're not happy with Greg Roman. But, I, I mean, you know, I think we'd only played Two games? a couple games, right? And, and the offense the year before was good. And he wasn't right? a fly-by-night. The offense, yeah. And, and, and Tyrod was the quarterback. And, and Tyrod had his limitations as, as, a, as a thrower. Yeah. So I felt like they maximized. Well, McCoy, we saw McCoy. Right. A team. And, and uh, granted, he was a uh, grossly high proportionate uh, part of the offense. Like, without him, it was hard to see we are going to move the ball too well. But still, it, it was a shock to have uh, to have it happen. You know, that early in the season with a guy that that had a track record and now naturally like you just as you just said uh with Baltimore uh he's going to be in, in a playoff game uh personally he's one you know I had a whole range of inner uh levels of interaction with coaches and my level of interaction with Greg Roman was was pretty limited okay you know uh he he was I would compare him to I met with every, every coach that ever came through that thing. I met with personally uh, to talk about their relocation and things we pay for that wouldn't, and you know, whether taxable or not. And uh, I got a vibe from him that, um, yeah, let's get sober with quick. Like he wanted to get to work uh, in a way, not quite as scary. And maybe I'm ruining, ruining this for another time. You bring him up with Mike Patton, um, literally just stared at me like, how much longer are we going to be talking yeah. about this? My whole goal is to make a five minute pitch, <laughs> right. well, and they and they they've probably did this before, and, right? Yeah, These guys and, have been well. We what we wanted to. Mr. Wilson kind of prided himself in in offering generous packages to these guys, so we were always kind of, and it always happened in January, like a brutal right. time, like now, right? Right now, yeah. maybe, maybe a week from now, our yeah. staff would would start coming in, and we want to make them feel welcome. It's it's a not a good time of year football. Is months and months and months away, but yet a guy like Roman, Mike Petten, they they want to get to work, and, and by work meaning 
review film of, of what right wrong and what they want to well, do. You, your meeting with them was could be seen as an annoyance for a football coach. A uh, necessary evil, something they need to know, but let's just not make it any longer than it needs to be. Yeah. And I, I remember getting that vibe from him and Mike Patton. Some guys, it was the opposite. We're like, you know, they, hey, ask me about my career. And and uh, I was okay with that again. January, I didn't feel like I was changing them or the team out of, of quality coach time right and, you know <laughs> right uh but uh at the same time it was almost a head scratcher as to why they'd want to spend so much time talking to me greg Rowan was on the, <laughs> the that yeah. spectrum yeah and then, i guess i guess just yeah. from the from the limited things i've seen on on television and, and just hearing him speak over and that doesn't surprise me seems yeah. like it's just a down to down to business um, down to business he was you know and, and yeah. there are a lot of those guys like there are a lot of yeah. those you no know, personality and doesn't mean he's not a nice guy but just it's all by the way the relevant to you i'm not trying to get away from the other one but in talking to martin here we go again he was at an event uh how did this come up he went to an event oh it was in hamburg over the summer to ted cottrell's oh. 75th birthday party because i i was asking him about you know his playing days and he said he uh, Broach was the head, was his coach for yeah. three, four years. The year far was Bill Bradley. Was Bill Bradley. Yep. I saw Bradley over, over the summer. I know that you worked with him. Super nice guy. Yeah, he liked him too. Super nice. Like just, he was one of those, the opposite of, of Greg Roman. I remember Bill yeah. Bradley came, asked me, you know, how I was doing, where I'm from, you know, just real, and just, just. Yeah. You know, seemed like a normal human, which in the NFL sometimes rare, yeah, right? right? Like, yeah. I, and it sticks out. It sticks out to me. Like Bill Bradley felt like just a genuine guy, and he played in the league. He was a good and, player. He was a good player, yeah. right? And yeah. then he had a good coaching career. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, that's probably dictated by the coordinator and then you know the head coach. And he, you know, Bill Bradley kind of was able to 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 fit in with that staff because Ted Cottrell is a larger than life personality. Like any room Ted Cottrell's and you know Ted Cottrell yeah, in that yeah. room. He was I had a lot of fun and and boisterous and 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 but then his assistants were much more reserved. You know, John Levera and and Bill Bradley, you know, you had to like lean in to hear it speak all. Yeah. You know, they were real quiet. So the defensive meeting rooms, it was Ted talking 95% of the time. And huh. then you know the coaches talking much less. Second coach that I have for you, uh, this is a more obscure one, and I don't know if i thinking of the same person. Dick Lee. <laughs> All right, that's what we like. We like when we get the, the, the last. So David Lee was with two times. Okay. Um, and when the second time we heard him. What, what, what position was he? Quarterback coach. Okay. Yeah. Was he the guy kind of like this studious um yeah, I think kind okay. of kind of a kind of a Tom Dahoe-ish premature growing like like he wasn't anyway, like that distinguished gentleman. Okay. okay. Uh so when he got rehired by a different staff, and again, here we go. I don't know if the first time it was with Malarkey and the second time he came back, it was with Chad Ailey. That's kind of how I think it was. But uh, it could have been offset by one. But um, they asked me to pick them up on a um, a Saturday night from the airport. Okay. And the stuff you did. You yeah. Know, oh, yeah. 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 So, it was 24-7. Yeah. In a perfect world, everything happens between 9 and 5. Yeah. Really so, hey, yeah, Dave Lee's coming in at uh, 7 o'clock on a Saturday night. And can you pick him up at the airport and take him to his apartment? And I said, sure. Yeah. I mean, I've been doing it all week. And uh, I picked him up, and he I got his number. He was happy to see that I was still with the team. Okay. Like I was a familiar face from his tenure. Sure. Um, and for whatever reason, I had gotten um, into, on the radio at home, I was watching the Seattle Green Bay game. Oh, the, that playoff game where, where they recovered the onside kick? I, I think so. And, it, okay. and, and I think Seattle had like a huge comeback. Yes. Yep. And I was into the game, even though I, you know it was an NFC game. But just as an NFL yeah, fan, it was great, I was really it was into great the game. game. So I'm listening to the game on the radio in the car. Yep. And this is on me as we're talking. He was like, uh, "Oh, oh, I remember. Okay, this will help." He goes, uh, "What do you think about Tyrod?" <laughs> as if you know. Okay, I'll try to think about. It. I, I, you know, you, you didn't do the uh, the Mid Wilson no. <laughs> report. The left tackle from the University of Texas. Oh. 
Oh my god. Uh no, I didn't I didn't do that. But I said, you know, he's, he's liked in the building. He think he throws a nice deep ball and um like if he could uh you know, the consensus around the building is if he could get better on the quote easier intermediate throws, he could be really good. that's what I think too. But I can't wait to watch film him and meet him. I was like, okay. I was just the first person he, he ran into and I, I was but I for some stupid reason, I was so in that Seattle Green Bay game yep. on the radio that I have to admit, even though he was in the passenger seat, he had kind of eighty percent of my attention. Yeah, or he should have had a hundred. Like, sure. what? Why? Why did I care so much about the game? I don't know. I found myself, and I'm thinking to myself, Don, just give this guy attention. You only have a twenty minute ride to the airport in the game. You'll find out what happens. What, was he into the game? Did he care? No, no, no he didn't know the score. Okay. He's like, oh, this is the, yeah, was, oh, okay, interesting. And I just wanted to bite on to so, it. What weird for him, so I don't know how many times a guy came back a second time. Nate Hackett was one. Okay. Uh, Could have come back a third time. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it, so, it was weird. Um, is it weird for those guys coming back? I mean, you've been fired, and now I know that being fired is, is part of the NFL. But is yeah. it weird to come back? Did you it, feel like that was weird for guys? It back? was, but you know what? And and I think Buffalo fans, particularly those that um, that live here in Western New York, what I noticed in later years were uh, for the handful of guys that had been here before, um, worked for other teams, and come back like David Lee and some of those other guys. Uh, you know, I would follow up with them the next day. How's it going? Everything going? I know you know the drill. And a lot of them said they were really excited and impressed to see uh how downtown buffalo had Im huh. improved interesting they they noticed that and and it's funny because when we had uh andy Tomorrow, um with his interview you were showing me a picture of the building downtown of new era which i had seen and for some i didn't know that was their building but yeah. just another example it was it was cool uh you know you talked about a uh, um the episode that we did um Mar right after Mar hamlin came back and about your your pride in Buffalo, you didn't specifically mention downtown Buffalo, but um, it's funny the coaches always knew we had good restaurants, huh. but they they noticed how how downtown Buffalo just seemed better. So he had more to offer, That's cool. and it was good to hear. Tur Turk Schoner came back a second time. There's right? a good call. Yeah, huh. he was in my he was in my book because uh, about the October storm, Friday the thirteenth, October two thousand six, uh, because he was had a reference. He was with the Saints during Katrina. Oh, jeez. And he uh, really, wow. like, showed how scary it was. And, wow. Um, and then he was here for the storm, and, you know, he hearing the trees crack reminded him of Katrina. Now, they were apples and oranges in some way, but right. that's a good call. So, yeah. so before we finish up this, in honor of, of, of Black Monday and the, and the coaches getting Wait, fired. Two. The, 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 we're done with the, the wheel. Oh, okay. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna play a little oh. game of Power Rank. The head coaches. We, we have not done this yet on the show. <laughs> you were the director of football administration, and there were how many head coaches throughout um, your tenure in that see, role? My, my title became director of football administration at five. But let's, I, let's, I, let's include but Greg I, Williams. I, yeah, because I, I was like, I had a, uh, yeah. So, Greg Williams was the first so Greg coach. Williams, I were, yeah. Mike Malarkey, mm -hmm. Dick Duran. Mm -hmm. Rex Ryan, Chan Gailey. We're not including interim coaches, right? Like Perry Fuel had an interim three right. games. Were there during... five? There was five, right? Greg Williams, Mike Malarkey, Chan Gailey, Dick Duran, Rex Ryan. Is that correct? Doug Murray. Oh, yeah. I forgot about St. There's. Uh, all right. <laughs> all right. Sorry. I'm. I, uh, apologies to my friend Pat and Syracuse grad who. Oh, you what? What the heck? Pat is. Yeah. Pat is a Syracuse yeah, guy. Pat has some. So, Pat has some, Doug, some feeling about Doug. Marone. Doug Marone was insulted that I didn't realize that his Syracuse Orangemen played a game at Key Stadium. Mm. He was talking about. Do you lose, remember the did game? Lose? I don't know. Mm. But I remember the game in Yankees, and and I looked at him. They're like, "You know what I'm talking about, right?" You know, and, like, and I I didn't. <laughs> All right, so we're gonna play this in yeah. two separate rounds. What? The first round is give me from from least to most that you'd want to be stuck in an elevator. <laughs> can I see the list? <laughs> yes, you sure can. Uh, so who your is ring's pretty good? Who is the person that you would want to be stuck in an elevator with most of those stuck? That, Stuck. Is, is, like, is the, the elevator, up, the elevator at one build drive is 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 inoperable, and you're in there for three hours till maintenance can come fix it. Which of the six would you most want to be in an elevator with? <laughs> um, does the coach not to, not to complicate? Oh my goodness! No, here. no. Does <laughs> does is the coach part of the problem solving? 
getting the elevator that's fixed. Up to you. You're the one who knows the coach more than I do. So you, no, some no, might no, be no, more, but... some might be more active in the process. Some others might sit back and wait for the all maintenance. Right. Okay. All right, all right, all right. Um, who who would be your first choice to be stuck in an elevator with? Greg Williams. Okay. Second. We have an air horn. Wait, wait, wait. So there's going to be somebody last here. Is this going to end up being a sound play? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> the guy, I don't hate to be stuck. All right, all right. You know what, then? Let's do this. Top three. Okay. Greg Williams. Okay. So some of these guys is going to be knock on them. Well, we're not going to list your bottom three. It's just your like, top like, three. Like, like Chan Gailu's nice man just didn't speak. Yeah, well, that there's some benefit. Well, I mean, you were, you were with Wade. Yeah, Wade, Wade, Wade would have been fun enough. You think he, so? Yeah, he would have just told stories and just okay. he'd have been so chill. That surprised he me, wouldn't kinda. have cared. Um, I'm gonna go with uh, Greg Wolf is is a, a okay. number one. Um, uh, Mike Malarkey was like scripted. I think he always had to feel like he had to play the part, and he couldn't. He wouldn't really bust out of his his you know that box. Uh, I'm gonna go with Rex. Okay, and this might surprise some people, but uh, but Dick Duran was just just a, a nice man. I he, Dick would have kept you safe. Well, in the elevator, I, and my safety was an issue. No, here. well, it, it's all included. I mean, he probably would have like tried to find a way to punt while you were in the <laughs> elevator, right? <laughs> Nobody uh, loved to punt more than Dick Duran. Dick Duran would have been um, seemingly and sincerely, like genuinely, and just worried about it. Yeah, like would. Yeah, we'll, we'll be fine. Out. Yeah, whatever else is the guys, my staff are taking care of uh, the football end of things. Sure. I don't mind sitting here talking to get to you to know you a little bit better. Round two, you have to win a game to save your own life. Oh man, who's your top three coach? And and this is based on the assumption that they the all have the same roster. Right. All right, that's a fictional scenario, but okay, I'll go I'll play along. Yeah, so so top three to save your life. <laughs> um, mm -mm. Uh, oh man, man, we see. I would, I would say Malark here, but remember when we had the playoff game? The the we had, uh, we had Luke Russert on, and he brought that O four yeah. game up where the Steelers that was the worst loss of the drought. Play their backups, yeah, and and basically said, "Hey, we're in. We're gonna." Throw you a favor, like yeah. Luke brought that up, but that was malarkey. It was the worst? That, that was the worst loss of the drought, right? The most common one. I mean, that was that was the few times we were in it, <laughs> you know, in the final week with yeah. a chance to get in. Um, uh, I'm, I'm. Are you, are you are you struggling here because the quality of choices is so great? Well, I'm I'm <laughs> I'm trying to go with historical reference, uh, you know, some actual examples, uh, and so Mike Blake is out because of that year. Um, uh, I'm going to go with Chan Gailey. I mean, I, I think I actually thought all the coaches that were let go, he was the one on that list that was let go the most prematurely. Okay, so he'd um, been your first choice to win a game. To save yeah, him. yeah, and I'm going back. I don't think enough of a, a chance in Buffalo. Like historically, he was pretty good. He had a experience in Dallas, and he was an offensive coordinator with Dolphins. He had some success around the league. You know, agreed. Who would be second? Um, <clears throat> Greg Williams. Greg Williams. Okay, well, that, that's fair. I think yeah. we probably know who would be last, but we'll we'll leave it to <laughs> we'll leave it to listeners. Uh, we'll leave it to listeners' imagination. Listen, you did the spin the wheel. I, I I know I signed up for that deal, and then you threw this at me. Uh, it's fair. No, okay. no, no. You did. It's a you, exercise. Uh, you, did, yeah, actually. You, you did. You did. You did. You did yeah. great. But we're gonna uh, we're gonna now uh, have a a Andy Altamont Andy, come yeah. on and and talk about. All right, let's do it. You can go now. All right, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we are joined by Andy Altamar, the general manager, Delaware North at Highmark Stadium. Uh, Andy, um, I we would be privileged to have you at any point, but the fact that you're coming on with us this week with a home game coming up, and I'm going to go ahead and say two home games coming up, uh, really means even more. So thanks and welcome. Thanks. Thanks for having me. All right. So... A uh, little personal story here. Uh, Josh was asking me how I knew you, and I, I, I told him it was kind of ironic because my years at the Bills, um, you were you were at a very prominent position there at Delaware North, and you were the head chef for the team. But I didn't see you that much in the building, and uh, when I really had the opportunity to get to know you was in 2015 when the team we played a regular season game in London, 
uh, against Jacksonville. And uh, the team wanted to bring over their own personal chef for the whole week. And that was you. And I, I was at the state or uh, the hotel offices there. Uh, the, there was another hotel downtown London, but I wasn't there. I was in with the team. And uh, at night, we would, after a hard day's work, have a, have a pint, as they say That's there. I got to have some pints, right? <laughs> yeah, some pints. Okay, yeah. With you and your wife. And um, yeah. it, it was great to get to know you there. So I, I just, that was what, before we get into how, how to prep a stadium, still mind boggling how you do that. Uh, but what, what was the experience like for you? How did that come about and what were the challenges of it? Uh, it was it was a, a fun and a unique experience, right? Food is the center of really all people. And when you go city to city, state to state, now country to country, it's very different, right? And um, at the time I was, when I first started work for Delaware North in 2013, it was with the Buffalo Bills. I was the executive chef here. Uh, and so the team feeding is a portion of it, right? So there's also suites, clubs on the stadium side of it, you know, that, that I would have oversight. So um, when the trip was coming up to London, right, the, the, one of the biggest thing for the players is that, you know, it's repetition, right? It's, it's the players want to be, feel comfortable with what they're eating for their nutritional needs and their recoveries. Um, and they're used to what they're used to, right? They're used to repetition. They're not used to uh, something that might look different and therefore don't want to put it in their bodies if they don't feel that that's going to, you know, make them sick or what have you, right? Their bodies are their temples. They need to stay healthy. Um, right. And so I worked with Bill's leadership and uh, we went over, I think it was like June or July, the game was in October in the regular season. And we went over there to, to take a look at the, the location that we were going to stay at for the, for, the, uh, for the week and really do an analysis of what is the food service there, what is the flavoring profiles, and then really come back and say, okay, what do we need to ship from the United States that we can't get over there or that we just think might be an issue, right? Uh, and so we ended up shipping probably about 30 pallets worth of products through cargo liners, just of certain ingredients, simple things like peanut butter that you can't get over there, right? Such an American staple and so simple, right? It's not there. And so, you know, they don't know what peanut butter and jelly sandwiches are, a, a basic, you know, nutritional comfort food in America. Uh, they don't have that over there. And so, uh, and then, you know, got everything over there and then traveled with the team, you know, after our game here, went over there and just really worked with the, the culinary team um, and then also giving the players a peace of mind. Some of them knew who I was, the leadership knew who I was. So just, again, if they had any questions on things, I can kind of uh, work in the back and kind of coach some of the cooks and stuff on how to do things. So uh, very yeah. unique experience, you know, but things like scrambled eggs and, you know, some things that you just take for granted that, you know, how you are used to seeing Americanized is cooked differently and, and visually and tastes a little bit different uh, overseas. So Yeah, yeah. I, and, I remember partaking, you know, I, I ate all the meals there and it was my home for a week too. And uh, I was impressed because you're right. It had that familiarity. I'm sure you work with Eric Siano. He said the strength coach to make sure the nutritional needs were met for the team. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, but there was always like a dish or two that kind of had a, a local flavor to it. Something you might not have known what it was, but it was there if you wanted to try it. And we, we were right. just trusting you and it was it was good. It was all good. So yeah. So so Andy, let's uh let's talk about getting the stadium ready. Is there any differences between a, a, a playoff game and a regular season game? Uh there is, right? Just like anybody else, you know, you, you want to keep turning up the dial on services and offerings and different things. Uh, not that we're not constantly teetering that and trying to push those envelopes in the regular season, uh, but we just think a little bit differently in, in different services and different areas of the stadium. Um, this year we launched something called the Hometown Chef Series where we're, you know, we're a community company too, right? Delaware is based in Buffalo. Uh, and we try to incorporate local businesses and what we do and help each other out and help be successful. And so, and I, and I think more importantly, it helps um, create unique experiences for our guests and our fans. That's really what we also want to do. Uh, and so like this game coming up, we are in our hometown chef series. We're featuring uh, the restaurant, the little pig out of uh, uh, the Williamsville area, right? Great following. Um, there's a couple other local businesses that we're working with. Uh, in different areas of the stadium. We have a chef's test kitchen inside the Miller Light Brew Pub where the chefs are always ideating something different. This year they have uh, this game, they have something called the Hurdle Burger, right off of Josh Allen's 
hurdle. And so it's this triple stack <laughs> burger. Gooey has like a Josh Allen hurdling type pick. And so just, you know, fun plays that, you know, the, the culinary team loves to, the food and beverage team loves to get in there and try to ideate different things, right? Yeah, you mean, I, my first house was at, at the corner of uh, Colvin and, and Hurdle, and you just made me think it wouldn't surprise me if they change the spelling of Hurdle yeah. Avenue coming up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And do you I think keep putting Josh on top of the sign there, and they keep taking yeah. him down. Right. It's keep going up, right? All right. So, so I met Don uh, when I began interning uh, with the Bills in the in the merchandise department, and it was interesting watching the patterns of like what people purchase uh, during you know warm weather, cold weather. Um, you know, rain, whatever. From a food standpoint, from a from a concession standpoint, like how 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 much different is it like for a, a cold weather game than, than a warm weather game? It's uh, it's dramatically different, and it, it, the weather is the biggest uh, from our business standpoint is the biggest controlling factor of how people will spend. Right, uh, this playoff game, thank goodness, is thirty degrees warmer than what it was in the playoff game last year. Right, four <laughs> degrees, five degrees is what it was, and then we were last year we were a little nervous on like beers freezing and stuff like that, which it was freezing in people's hands and stuff like that. Uh, this one's going to be very similar to the game this past Sunday, where it's going to be, it's actually going to be beautiful. Sun's going to be out, going to be 30 some degrees, right? Perfect, perfect football weather. Um, uh, and, and therefore the fans are, you know, they like to celebrate. They'll buy one more beer. They will take one more trip to the retail store and buy something and, you know, you know through their path and their journey of wherever they're going in the stadium. It's, it's, weather is a huge impact. Yeah, it, ha it has to be. And um, speaking speaking of beers, so maybe throw us some numbers. For another thing too, like that just um, bogged my mind in, in terms of how different it is to prep. Like I can picture a restaurant, let's say, you know, on a Friday night, they think maybe on the low end, we'll have 300. And on a high end, we might have 500. You know, we got to prepare for that staff and getting food wise. For you, Looking at it's either going to be zero or seventy four thousand, and maybe two weeks in a row. Like, yeah. what are right. what are the challenges uh, with that? Uh, the team has a great plan in place, and 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 our departments meet weekly on you know constant process improvements and how we're doing things. And you know, we talked about the weather. The other things that take into effect is you know these aren't Sunday one o'clock games all the time this year. We we have been lucky these past couple of weeks where that's what it used to always be, but. You know, Saturday night games and Monday night games and Thursday night games followed by at one o'clock. Like all those times and days and time, it all matters in how we prepare food and beverage and quantities and all that. Because you know, where does that put you in your natural eating hour? Right, one o'clock you're coming in almost lunchtime. Four o'clock you're not necessarily you know you're in a snack time, but not a dinner time. You're eight o'clock prime time game. You're kind of coming into the natural dinner hour. So like all those factors come into play on how we prepare. From a quantities, from an offering standpoint, maybe maybe there's a limited time offer special, you know. And football runs summer, fall, winter, right? And so do flavor palettes, right? And so we try to, you know, take an approach of seasonality in all of our food and beverage offerings, and we focus a lot on throughput. How fast can the guests get through the line? Because right, they're there to watch a big game, spend a lot of money to be there. They want to get, you know, use the restroom, grab something, get to their seat quickly. Uh, and, and we try to model anything that we're selling that it, it's a quick decision. It's a quick service item. The quality is what it's supposed to be. And, you know, go get them back to their seats to finish watching the game. Yeah. You know, I, I heard this past Sunday and I don't know how relevant this was to you or if you would have anticipated this, but I heard people that went to the game said they can't recall a game where virtually the entire stadium was seated before the national anthem. Uh, knowing that there was going to be a trip to Damar Hamlin. Was was that something that uh, you, you made things seem different uh, from your standpoint? It, it is, it, and it's 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 a trend. The stadium has been is doing well this year. I mean, it started last year in COVID where, you know, we had all the screenings and the requirements from the government. So the gates used to open up an hour and a half before kickoff, and last year the bills moved it to two hours, and we sustained that this year. And I think that's been very helpful where – you know, we didn't know if they were going to revert back to kind of like, okay, it's, it's a tailgating crowd, right? That's the, the culture of the fans here. And, and then they get here to the last minute and then the gates get jammed. People have been coming in early and the Bills have been seeing a successful percentage of fans in-house before the gates kick off. And what that does is it creates such a better fan experience when they come into the stadium. They're not all rushing to the concession line. There's almost no lines, but people are going through because like you're walking around, you're like, are people going through our bit? You know, are they, are they going through the lines? 
but they all have something, right? And then when you get to the national anthem and you look around, you're like, wow, most of the building is filled, right? We're talking 95, 99% type of things. And a lot of this, you know, in the 90s this year, which was very good. And obviously with the DeMar Hamlin situation and everything's going on, it definitely drove that emotional state and get people inside the stadium. So it's, it's beneficial for everybody, right? Most importantly, the fan experience, because they're not log jamming um, the concession lines at the last minute. There, there's like this pressure relief that happens. Still get the punch at halftime, but that walk-up has changed. So maybe a, a couple of like fun facts or fun numbers that I, I don't know if you, you have yeah. uh, in your, in, in your head. Numbers at you. Do, you, do, you have, do you have any idea? Is there is there a game where there was like a, a, a exorbitant amount of beer sales? Like is there one game that you can remember or point to or your guys know of that like the beer sales were just exponentially higher than any other? Is it a win, a loss? Like do you know? With the way that the team's playing, right, and and you know where the where the team's at, it's just always like a celebratory feel when people are in the stadium. So naturally, people will buy more, right? They'll keep going, and obviously, we monitor that, make sure people are safe and not over intoxicating themselves. Um, but you know, through the course of this year, we we've, we've served. You know, our job on a, on a game day is to feed roughly seventy thousand people in two hours, right? That's our job, right? And so the the effort and the resources that go behind it. Uh, there's just so much there that people don't realize. Like we're serving more people in two hours than restaurants will do in a, in a year, right? And and so this year we've between retail and um, the food and beverage locations, we've served almost, just under a million fans this year. Like when you look at like the check av- checks and stuff like that. So you're talking 10, 11, 12 events, right? Just about under a million people that we've served. Um, you know, quarter million bottles of water. There's over 15,000 pizzas we've sold, you know. So, I mean, the, the numbers continue to speak for themselves. We've probably sold about 900,000 beers or so. 900,000. Um, yep. Oh, man. Is there, is uh, someone get a free beer when they buy the a millionth beer? That'll be not this week, but next week. Right. Launch right. Right. the loft right here. He is. Yeah. Uh, right. What's the, uh, what's, is there something like a strange request or like something fans have clamored for that you can't believe? I'm sure you probably get requests for certain food items, beer, you know, alcohol, whatever. Any memorable ones that you can remember that you said, yeah, yeah, no, probably not. <laughs> not that I could think of. You know, we throw some you know, really, really crazy stuff out there, whether it's, you know, you know, burgers in between sticky buns or, you know, something, you know, off the wall. It's like what we like to do, you know, something that's Instagrammable, but, you know, not necessarily what everybody wants to eat type of thing. Um, but the food, you know, at the stadium and the beverage offerings, it, it, it's a very indicative of the local area. We try to focus on, like, what are the flavoring profiles of Western New York, just, not just hot sauce and blue cheese. There's so much more, right? And um, a lot of it is is some of the wayfinding, meaning, like, you know, We've done some insight studies with, this, with with our fans to understand more and more, what are they looking for? How can we continue to improve that? You know, whether it's a product, a line or whatever, a service style. And, you know, a lot of what we see in some of these studies is like they may be looking for something, say like a beef on weck, right? And they don't think that it's in the building, but it is, or they're looking for pizza logs and they don't know that it's in there or a bone and wing and it is in there, right? But, the, you know, when you're traveling to a game, you're pretty much going to go to your section. You're, you know, there's your seat. There's the restroom. There's one or two concession stands. You're really not going to venture on past that. And, and that's part of, like, there's some things that we're strategizing and trying to help those fans understand. You are looking for that item. It might be just one more section over. Maybe it's a craft beer. Maybe it's a, you know, Italian sausage or a piece of pizza, whatever it is they're looking for. Yes. Yeah, so, um, so you have to think of signage, too. Like, say, fans that come in for, you know, they come in North Carolina for one game and they want to have that when in Rome Buffalo experience and they they're each other we want beef on weck and they go there and you want to say hey just a couple aisles down you can you can get that and check yeah. that box yeah <clears throat> yeah how how and, changing it with like the age of the stadium you know and and how cha- are, are you looking forward to the new stadium a hundred percent. Yep. It's, yeah. uh, you know, we're, we're limited in some of the, you know, the, the facilities in which we're working in. Um, it is an older building, the concourses that, you know, with how narrow they are, that presents problems and bottlenecking and lines and crowd controls and things like that. Um, and, you know, the wants and needs and demands of the fans constantly change. We still invest in this building. We still invest in our operations. We've invested significant money this year. 
uh, into our operations to continue enhance fan experience. So it's not like just because we know the stadium is going to come to end of life, you know, four more years of football or so is still it's a long time, right? And a lot of fans that we're still going to feed, you know, as you can see, potentially a couple million people. <laughs> and so we want to make sure that we're, we're we're still on point and doing whatever we can in the current situation. And then, you know, the new building is going to be you know, a whole different ballgame. Yeah, I'm sure a lot. What a lot of people don't know about Delaware North is all of the other um, arenas that that you you have. I, you and I had another conversation about um, um, possible business, and I remember I brought up the Texas Rangers, and oh yeah, we do that stadium. And I just mm-hmm. I, I think uh, for a Buffalo based company, um, how many? If you know, like how many other arenas and other sports uh, do you have, and are there some? I can imagine that maybe you visited and you thought, mm-hmm. oh, wow, you know, this this region, just sorry, I'll use the Kansas City reference, whether you have that or not. But, hey, they're known for their barbecue. And, wow, look how they do their barbecue. Mm-hmm. Do you get some good ideas from other venues that you implemented? We do, you know, whether it's our own or, you know, competitors of ours. Um, you know, Delaware North is a multi-billion dollar hospitality company headquartered here in Buffalo, owned by the Jacobs family. Uh, a lot of people surprisingly don't know what we do, right? They see this you know, big, beautiful building downtown and they, uh, is it a bank? Is it, what is it, right? And, uh, you know, there's the different divisions of business sports is the core of the, you know, the foundation, the found, founder of how the business was founded. Uh, we've got, I think, about 50 professional sporting accounts throughout the world uh, in the sports service division, right? Uh, heavily baseball, there's football, NHL, soccer, we've got some, we have some stadiums that we operate overseas, like Wembley Stadium, there's stuff in Australia, Singapore, uh, so that there's a, there's an outreach there. Uh, so yeah, there's, and we have strong resources in our food and beverage and our corporations and lots of, you know, communications of, you know, if the Jaguars are coming here to play, I'll reach out to my counterparts and say, hey, what do they like, you know, what are some things that are there? And our teams do travel, whether it's to support or just to go see some of these other accounts and you know other stadiums and venues to see what are they serving, how are they serving fans, what are the, some of the food items, and you know it's a good camaraderie of back and forth. Like you know we'll take some ideas and bring it back here and throw it against the wall, see what we can do, and, and vice versa. We'll, you know, so it's it's great networking. Yeah. So I've got, a lot of, yep. I'm just, sorry, I've got a, I've got a a tough question for you, and then a, and a story, then a story you might uh you might appreciate. Are you a Sabres fan or a Bruins fan? Seeing who signs your checks. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. I'm actually from Philadelphia, so can I say Flyers? No, I can't. Oh man! All right, I guess. Uh, so, wow. <laughs> uh, kind of the so, kind of the year where they say you know the Eagles and the Bills will never play in a Super Bowl. We're good, right? But this year, I don't know. <laughs> there you go. So when I when I like I said when I worked there, um, you know we we were in charge of the merchandise stands throughout the stadium. It was still you know the Bills operation at that at that point. We were a little mom and pop organization, and one of my favorite things to do after like especially like a sunday one o'clock game was we ended up finding ourselves like either in the suites or in the administrative building and there were always plates of chicken fingers left over in the suites i tell you the the, i always i've mentioned it on this podcast before the delaware north chicken fingers were a plus and some of those would find their way back to my house uh and i would eat like a king for the week uh because you know there's is there a lot of like is there a lot of food waste what do you guys do with the food that is left over after a game i'm by the way i'm gonna text you josh's address so you can send him the bill for yeah oh yeah 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 Yeah, there were there were plates of there were plates of chicken fingers that made it back to my house. <laughs> uh, yeah, we're you know we we love to be involved with the community. It's very important to us, and we work with City Mission of Buffalo, Niagara Falls, and you know a day or two after every game. You know there are some some ways to have it. You know with the volume of food things that you're feeding, and we donate all donatable foods uh, to there. And uh, you know we work with the other charities like Western, you know, be more Western New York. Delaware is heavily involved with. Lou Jacobs, one of our CEOs, is on the board there, and you know we we do a lot of work with them in the community and you know in times of need, and um, yeah, we're we're always sending food to those locations. That's nice. Yeah. Good yeah. Job, well, man. well, and some of it made to made it to a, a one story ranch in Taiwan <laughs> back in the back in the late nineties. Uh, it was yeah. it was great though. I mean, you just walked around and it, it smelled good, and the because Don's office was across from some of the. Sweets in the end zone. Uh, for a time, yeah. Well, when I right, was when there, there, and uh, we just always, it we always man- managed to, you know, yeah. snag a few chicken fingers while we were doing our work. Well, good stuff. Yeah. yeah, Andy, listen, I, um, 
this this has been great. I know, like I said, you're not preparing for one playoff game, but for two playoff games here. Maybe yeah. three. Hopefully uh, three. Yeah. Oh, that's right. You're there is making, a, there there is a yeah. scenario yeah. where there's a third. That's right. Okay. Yeah, I saw that on my own uh, Ticketmaster for my tickets this morning. That's still out there. Yeah. I, yeah. I keep getting if. You know, yeah. It's not, a, it's not for sure the Chiefs are going to, you know, they can yep. get upset. Sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But um, uh, yeah, anything else you want to leave us with? This has been great. I'm excited for people to hear kind of a behind the scenes uh, uh, a view of how 70, I still, the stat you said earlier about feeding 74,000 people in two hours is more than a lot of restaurants yeah. do in a year. That one, that's, that's fantastic. Yeah. So. Yeah, we're but, really looking forward to it. The the team here is, is stoked and excited, right? We're all Bills fans and, you know, we all work hard and to see it come to this, you know, culmination and Dolphins are a great rivalry. I mean, you know, we'll see if two plays or not. And uh, But regardless, it'll be a good game. The energy is going to be electric. You know, when we were looking at the, the game last year, walking into that and the weather that, you know, again, we were talking earlier about how weather impacts so much. That also impacts your attendance, right? The weather's bad and you're like, yeah, I'll just watch it from home. And when it was four degrees last year and the forecasts are like, how many people are actually gonna show up? They did. And the energy in the stadium was like no other. And, and you know, because there's there's already already an electric energy in a you know, regular season football game. And then the, the playoffs, it just, do you uh, an indescribable feeling on the energy. How much how much of the game do you get to watch? Uh, I'll, I'll, I have an idea of what's happening by listening to the crowd as I'm walking around, you know, it's on all the TVs, you know, I just round and round and round. And then usually I catch the last bit of it, you know, from my office or something like that. So it's, it's relevant. We, we had, we, yeah, we had Jeremy Kelly uh, a few weeks ago and, you know, it's his job to check in with the alumni that he brought in where they are. And, you know, when they see him, they want to talk to him and it's during the game. And he said he could just to compartmentalize that moment to give the player, the former player, his attention. But then kind of as soon as it's over, you know, check right back to see what's going on in the game. It, mat it matters so right. much for, for people that uh, are so invested like like yourself. And uh, mm -hmm. so. All right. Well, thanks. Uh, thanks so much for your time. We really appreciate it. Good luck this weekend. Yeah, this has been great. Appreciate it. Thanks, right, Kevin. Thanks. thanks. Go All Bills. Right. All right. Take care. Okay, we are back from our interview with Andy. Uh, busy week coming up for him. Uh, some good insight, good stuff. Yeah, I, I love how he would, and it's his job, of course he is, but the fact that he talked about, uh, you know, there's three games they're prepping for. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. So just before we get to uh, our final segment of countries we have not done in a while, uh, maybe you and I talk just a couple of minutes about what it's like getting the stadium prepared from a merchandise point of view. Uh, obviously, things are different now. Uh, Delaware North runs the the concerns. They took yeah. that old, right? Yeah. What year did they take that? Do you mm. know? After, after we stopped doing that, I moved into business, moved to football. Julie Ring took over. She's from the Sabres. You you were already in in coaching under Wade. Uh, then Ben left. I think your, it was like two thousand five. Pat 2006. Walsh and Tim Kehoe worked yep. with with Julie, um, and then. Yeah, that sounds about right. Okay, and it was it's pretty interesting. I think people would be shocked and horrified at the <laughs> Bills Merchandise Department in the late 90s. As when I, I remember my first day interning there, I had some big expectations. <laughs> yeah. You know, I had, I, had, yeah. I had come over to your office and I had uh, interviewed for an internship. This was exciting opportunity of a lifetime for me growing up here. I'm 22. 22 years old and uh, no 21 tw 22 and i've got some big expectations i don't know what i'm doing i have no idea it was real big kind of came together last minute because you had a last minute opening for a third turn i come over i walk in the administration building first time i'm excited you know you're you're a nice guy great i think i met dan and you never took me to the field house we didn't go <laughs> so that was like a thursday or a friday and i was gonna start the next monday and I'm thinking, oh man, this is gonna write. I can't wait to get in the stadium and you know, have it be some office in the administration. Really well, it turns out that the merchandise department was the back of the security office. It was the coat closet of the security office in the field house. Correct. Uh, it, it was something like that. And the reason for that was <clears throat> um, to a couple things. Uh, 
prior to that, it was just for state sales. I mean, it's right. just, it was just game day. 10 times a year, yeah. game day. That's it. Game day. No, yep. Nothing else. Um, so, but then, you know, as, as things happen, you heard about what other teams were doing. Uh, we decided to start mail order by phone. And then, you know, it, the it, internet, internet was, was so it new, grow, but we had no, it was no, it was kind of a, a development. So there was a place in the ad building, which like you said, is very impressive. And, uh, it's what you'd expect an NFT yes. to work in, uh, then not so much. This was, <laughs> so this was, this was, so yeah. there was a security office when you walked in, you know, every, most people listening to this probably yeah. are familiar with the field house and you walk into that atrium and on the left hand uh -huh. side used to be the security office where they like one of those, yeah. those pull down doors, yep. the security guard would be there during practice. Basically just making sure, you know, they locked the front doors while the practice was going on, but just right. to make sure that, you know, keep an eye on behind that was like a, I don't know what you would even call it. Just like a coat closet or a, or a, I don't know what its original purpose was. Yeah. It was like a miscellaneous just room. No windows. No, no, no windows. Windows. No windows. Uh, room. enough for tasks. Uh, like but there was light concrete. Yes. Yeah. It's under block. Yes. Yeah, UV block. light. I mean, you felt like you were in jail. <laughs> like it, it honestly felt like it felt like a prison. Have you ever seen the movie Joe versus Volcano? I have not. Okay. It opens up with him and it, it, it as Hollywood do shows the most on drum work situation yeah. that anyone <laughs> that would drive him insane over time and to the point where he would rather jump into a volcano. Well, that, <laughs> if I'll do that, I, I remember going home the first night. I'm like, boy, if this was not the NFL and the Buffalo Bills, I ah. don't know if I would have, you know, because it just, yeah. there was no defined roles. There was four of us in there too, because there yeah. was, you know, Dan and then three interns, including me. So it was tight. Yeah. And it was ill-defined, whatever else. So anyways, we go from that. And then, you know, we worked on fan, the fan wagons, which were famous. Uh, yeah. You know, it was, it was, it was not glamorous. Uh, the, 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 most of the merchandise stands in the stadium were, you know, just cut out of the stadium, you know, like bunkers, almost yeah. Yeah. Uh, cinder box gold. Or they were, they were the ones you, we kept in the root the, behind the cages and rolled them out. Yes. Remember yes. That? They were like carts. like big blue boxes that opened up, but yes. they were on wheels and yeah. It was <laughs> it was just yeah. not what you'd expect uh, yeah. of an NFL operation in a successful franchise. And I just kept remember thinking to myself, they're leaving so much money on the table here. Yeah, you know, it, it's a, quite a flashback. And work with Steve Wilson, who I've talked to her a couple times. She she hasn't ruled out coming on our program. She's uh, uh, she still loves the Bills. She lives in Rhode Island. Um, so that I, I think that could be fun, but she did the buying. We would recommend the buying, and I think the biggest challenge that we had were jerseys, as you yeah, uh, with the Bruce Smith one you're wearing now that you do watch between episodes. Correct. Like, I've well, I've um, worn it every every uh, yeah. every episode since the Minnesota game. Well, yeah, they, they were, that's right. They were they were a big ticket item. They sold really well. We had a stars on those teams, a lot of big names, and uh, but they were made overseas. Uh, they took usually by champion at the time. They took uh, weeks, sometimes months, to get. And if you, if there was a hot player, let's just say a Chris Spielman or Bryce Pop, Eric a very very popular player, but during the last year of their contract, ah, uh, yeah, uh, you didn't. They were worthless if they didn't come back the team. So um, you know, you had a playoff game, and you want to make sure you had enough of a star player's jersey, he's like, ah, you know, we don't know if we're going to have, like Andy was saying, uh, you don't know if you're going to have that other game. I hope we do, but um, yeah, you, you could you could wipe out a lot of your profit margin by investing in jerseys that weren't, weren't going to be able to sell the next year. So Chris said, do you think we're going to resign? And I'm like, I hope so. But I, at the time, you know, later on, I would have some inside knowledge about our intent to keep sure. prepared. You weren't, you weren't that high up at that point. Yeah. But at the time, I, all I could do was speculate like anyone else sure. could. Did, did, um, did some, a lot of jerseys probably made way over to the same place that the four straight <laughs> uh, yeah. Super Bowl champion shirts. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Can you, can you just tell that story real quick before uh, we get to countries and go like they shirts for the bill there are there are people in the world yeah there are there are still existing bills super bowl champion shirts correct? they are near you know in africa has to yeah know. um 
Inter- here we go again. You gave me an O.J. Simpson story. It was Jeez. no, no, 1993, the AF Championship game, Kansas City, Kansas City. Um, they asked me in the fourth quarter at a certain point when the game was in hand, I think when we up, went up like 14, yeah. 17. That was against Joe Montana and yep. Marcus Allen, a good team. Yep. But Thurman had a crazy good game. And and at some point, they said, all right, Don, go put those uh, Super Bowl champ hats. AFC champ hats. AFC champ, sorry. AFC yep. champ hats on every player's okay. locker yep. stool. Yep. So I did it. I, it was just me. I was the only okay. person in the locker That's cool. room. That's cool. And all the uh, yeah, it was an amazing moment. Here yeah. we go, you know. And all of a sudden, I heard the door bust open to the locker room, like, and I heard this, hell yeah, woo, oh my gosh, oh, yeah. and I, it was OJ Simpson all by himself. He 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 managed to evade Lieutenant Boyer. <laughs> But somehow, Marlon and I talked about him again today. We'll bring him up again. But listen, OJ was not with anyone. He was with he, NBC, right? Yeah, oh, yeah, he was with, working for NBC, right. sidelines. Okay. But he was pre-positioning himself in the locker room right. to be there with him. Right. When I say not with anyone, there wasn't anyone with him. Sure. He was by so it was himself. just you and OJ Simpson in the Bills locker room. And he was going crazy sure. of, of joy that right. the Bills had back. won. And it was okay. like... I guess, you know, there's no one here you're trying to impress. You really are a, a big fan. So wh- right. whatever, however relevant that was, you know, it was just interesting. Sure, sure. So then after the AFC Championship game, they obviously have to print up Super Bowl champions for the team that wins. So yeah. they have them in the locker room and ready to go, the, right? Uh, yeah, the league does that. Okay. So they eat those. Okay. You know. And then they send them off. You know, somewhere else. Yeah, yeah. And I, when we were talking to Andy, and he said you asked him about where uh, the food goes that you don't use that you didn't pick up. Uh, you yeah. know, he talked about uh, you know giving it Buffalo City Mission, which is really cool. Yeah, that is cool. Uh, did you ever? So did you I ever think, have your hands on a on a Bills Super Bowl champion shirt? Like, did you ever have um, one in your possession? Super Bowl champ. I, I have a Super Bowl champion hat. Somewhere. You do. I thought about putting it back there, but I didn't. All right, you well, know what? I'll, I'll find it for the next okay. episode. Remind me. Yeah, those are kind of yeah. curious and interesting. Yeah, it's, it hurts to look at. You know, obviously, right? I bet. I bet. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's, that's, yeah that's, I've that's got a, one somewhere. That's a cool memory and, yeah. and, and a cool story. There, There is that famous interview. He, OJ, is uh, interviewing Ralph Wilson after the fourth AFC Championship game. Mm-hmm. And, and did you check his shoes that day? He, <laughs> remember that was the they whole thing. Yes, right. the that Bruno was that, the Bruno, Bruno Mali. Yep. Yep. Yeah, yes. and his boy Mark Allen was those. on the field that day. Yeah, it's just it's just, it's, it's crazy to think it what is. occurred six months later after you know after being in the locker room with OJ. You can't you can't even yeah. somehow he evaded Lieutenant Boiler. Right? <laughs> amazing <laughs> amazing Will skills. Boiler. You can see why he was a, a great NFL run back. You yeah. know, he's able to, to, to evade security. <laughs> uh, so before we wrap it up here, we will. Um, we will pick a country. It's been a while, so maybe Don, you remind people why we do this. So when we first started here, before joining Cup One, we we had to put them out there ourselves, and we learned how to do it. And on Apple, for some reason, it wouldn't accept. And we told you got to get an Apple, uh, and it wouldn't. So I went to a uh, mall, Apple store twice for two hours on a Saturday, and uh, they said, "Oh!" And finally, they let us know that it's because you have to go. All they have the countries pre-selected. And uh, you have to unselect them and then reselect them individually. And so uh, I, I did that. And I thought, hey, let's add two countries, each pick one for yeah. every time. And I think we're up to like, we have to be up to 26, 28. All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start so, here. Yeah. And you're going to have an initial negative reaction. Uh, I'm going to pick China. And I'm going to pick China for the specific reason that you will, you will, will find humorous. Who tell? Uh, I'm on Draft Kings. And uh, on DraftKings, sometimes they'll give you uh, promos and, you know, uh, basically incentives to, to take yeah. a bet. And uh, I have found the Chinese Basketball Association, which usually starts their games <laughs> about 10, like midnight. <laughs> and sometimes DraftKings will give you a boost. It's called like a, like a boost. Or a you say on DraftKings, you can bet on the Chinese you Basketball League? You can live stream. And you bet on it? I may or may not have that's right, up right, for right, debate. Right. Uh, it's legal. So oh yes, God. yes, I have. And and the ironic part is is that what, what, what you, makes you, you think you like how do you Oh I have no inside oh, information okay. at all. all it's right. just you'll get you'll get a you can boost your odds by twenty five percent. It's oh. just like it's just an incentive. So 10, 15 bucks if I can't sleep at night, whatever. I, I've gotten familiar with a few of the teams and ironically enough, all the players are American. 
So you'll recognize names. They're either guys who either are older, you know, trying to hang on, yeah. or, you know, there's some college basketball names that you'd probably recognize. Huh. Uh, I, and then, then there's a rule that a few of the players have to be native, you know, native Chinese players. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's an interesting brand of basketball. It's, it's, it's paced. It's actually not terrible to watch. Uh, there's not a lot of foul. It's a lot of like shooting and fundamentals. And it's, it's, it's interesting. I've, I've, I, I have, can't say that I've won any money doing it, <laughs> um, but I usually, whenever there's a, a, an opportunity to boost your odds or whatever else, I'll take that. So it's a curious for all the geopolitical reasons one might choose to China or not choose China. Correct. You chose it because you found out they have a basketball league over there that you can bet on and entertain. It. Okay, it's actually it's it's not a bad it's not a it's not a bad viewing. Yeah. It's not it's I, I I I was concerned that the level of basketball would be poor. And I would call it. I think it's better. Like they would be any American college team. Really? Yeah. Yeah. I. I maybe you know the, the national champion, but but these are pros. You know, these are older guys. Yeah. Um. And and apparently, like the fourth most skilled basketball league in the world. Really? Uh. So so you know, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna encourage you some night to check out. Uh. Tell me, tell me where to find it. Twenty I'll teams. Give it, give it a look. There's All twenty right. teams, and the bottom feeding teams are not good. Like, like right. there's a big disparity. I'm getting the names are. Hard to pronounce, not players, but of the what are they, provinces or state? What do they Usually call them? it's the cities, the cities, and then there's like I think there's four teams named dragons in some way oh, okay. the red dragons, the blue dragons. Right. Uh, some of them I don't know how to yeah. say their name, uh, but okay, but it, 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 it's been it's been a, a you know, small learning <laughs> process, it, not profitable, and, and I will uh, not be diving any deeper into the Chinese Basketball okay. Association, but it, uh, that's that's my that's my pick. Okay, that was that was in the left field, uh, that was interesting. So I'm just gonna go with Bermuda. I was looking at a map the other day for some reason, and I, I was struck by how you know Bermuda sounds like it's one of those uh, you know, way down there, it could be in countries, but latitude wise, it's not that far further south than like north carolina yeah yeah it's it's warm because of the gulf stream yeah, yeah. i just found that to be interesting you're right like, you you know you the co the the beach boy song you know bermuda yeah, Bahamas, right right you know yeah. but yeah no bermuda is like i think it's on the level of either virginia or north carolina oh, right yeah i was surprised but the currents must so anyway that for the reason i know they're a uh, popper and why were you looking still. at this map were you looking for a place to escape buffalo uh or, I'm, sh I'm sure it was during the storm you know what it's funny you say that because it was during the blizzard looking at radar and for whatever reason i i could just pulled it i guess inward it showed more and sure it was Bermuda. oh yeah it's Bermuda. i always I, thought that was south i saw a terrible study and it's been 12 days since the sun oh yeah uh, when we were talking to um was it kurt that's yeah. good interviews yeah we were about the weather coming up and we looked at it and they're like had possibility 30 percent chance of sun and like oh my gosh well, that would yeah. be 12, day, 12 days Ugh. out with a without a recorded sunny day so with that positive yeah. uh information we'll we'll uh we'll leave you guys we will uh be likely back on friday with a live show and yeah john's got some uh tales from the ticket office with uh some some old uh, employees and people aren't gonna believe what, what it took manually to to sell out a game especially a playoff game uh, it was funny to connect with some old colleagues who helped me break into the, the league, and they're excited to come on and share some stories. The only problem is it won't be long enough. Uh, but Don, was there so the long, highlights. Don was there so long ago that did you use, like, an abacus count? <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> it, will, it wasn't that far off. Yeah. <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll, see, we'll see everybody then. All right, then. Go Bills. <laughs> I want to bid you now farewell, but not goodbye. Thank you very much, Ralph. Today is a, is a bittersweet day for me. Uh, memories, many of which, which Mr. Wilson has alluded to, um, flood my mind right now. I'm surrounded by my thoughts and uh, indeed by the presence of... Uh, Friends unparalleled, visions from a lifetime of thrills keep flashing before me, and yet the uh, future beckons, and I look forward to it with excitement and anticipation. Because I'll tell you something, I'm a Buffalo Bills fan, so I advance it on that. And we finally, we 
finally came to an agreement and decided to move forward. And so now my time with the Buffalo Bills, in my opinion, has come to its natural conclusion. Uh, how do I begin to thank all those who have been instrumental in enriching my life here? <laughs> well, I can't do it adequately, and I know it. I can't adequately. But I remember you all fondly and forever. So it's an early day. Be sure you get your taping and breakfast in. The meeting tomorrow for all players will be an 8 a.m. meeting. Enjoy your day today, fellas. It's great because it was a special group of people uh, at a special time in the city. The team that we had really unified the region. And there are still people who think fondly of those things and remember some significant things that happened during that time that were, that were pretty cool. You see, our fans are great. You know, they come out, they get excited, and they come out and they cheer before the game. They're there, ready to go. And when you see that, when you walk out of that tunnel, you know, right now, here comes the electricity.